Hello, Agnes. Hey, Robin. Welcome back to the country. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be back. And uh, we are going to talk about modernism or something like modernism. We'll, we'll decide what it is exactly. Yeah, I am going to talk about the ethos common to Groff, Musil, Joyce, Pessoa, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, um, Proust, that set of people. And then Robin's going to talk about another thing, and somehow that's going to turn into a conversation, I think, is your thing. Well, so let's, let's go. I am motivated by the question of how culture has changed over the last few centuries. And you provocatively suggested that if, as I've postulated, culture has started to drift, that maybe artists and fine artists will have noticed that and had a reaction to it, and that maybe something near modernism uh, can be understood as a intelligible reaction of artists to a perception about how the modern world had changed. And then it's a big clue to the nature of the change in the modern world is the ways in which artists framed and reacted to what they saw as the change. Right. So um, the thing that inspired me to tell you that there was, the, um, that there seemed to be this moment where um, humanity cottoned on to cultural drift basically was that I was reading Musil's uh, The Man Without Qualities. I was rereading it. My last read was a long time ago. And um, and it seemed to me that that's what the novel was about. It was about finding yourself in a place where um, you could no longer quite inherit culture. You had to take this critical distance from it. Um, and you saw it as a thing that is itself you, you saw yourself at, at right be somewhat alienated from it. It's a kind of a there's a kind of downer mood to most of this literature. Um, there's something depressive about it. The heroes are sort of anti-heroes, or um, they're they're in most ways not very heroic, um, and, and they're just kind of trying to deal with or react to or respond to this feeling of being lost and of not knowing. Uh, like not knowing what to care about. Um, Virginia Woolf has like a famous line. Uh, in December of, it's something like this, I'm not quoting a perfect line. In December of 1910, uh, human nature changed. <laughs> um, uh, and I, think I just now read that quote actually in an essay uh, two okay, minutes yeah. ago. You read the essay, yes. Uh, I think that that, there's another essay in Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, which I, I would recommend as the better text actually of hers to, discuss this predicament but in any case uh so um yes i think that's what's happening in this period um and it's a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of different parts of europe um who are having the same revelation right around the same time um and they're expressing it in these kind of half philosophical half literary ways so in some way, Musil is later, because this book is 1955, so some by some marks past the end of modernism. So it takes place in 1913, and the first volume, which I, I don't think you've read beyond the first volume, am I correct? Correct. So that was published in 1930, and the first volume is the, yeah, the first volume was published, I think, I think in 1930, and then the second volume was published with much less fanfare because we're heading into a Nazi period and Nazis were not a big fan of him. Uh, before, I mean, in the Nazi period. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know exactly what year. Um, uh, and uh, so, I, like, I would say uh, Bussel's dates, that is, if you're born around 1880, which is roughly, I can't remember exactly the year of birth, then you're coming of age in this time period. So we have this huge range of the world and art, some of which has the label modernism, but I guess Musil is particularly interesting because he's not just expressing modernism. He is trying to describe the world 
of modernism as it changed and the characters in it as prototypical modern characters going through prototypical modern experiences, right? Right, but I actually think that's kind of, I mean, I think Bussell is the, is the best exemplar. I haven't, I haven't read all of these authors. I've read most of them. Right. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think Mussel is, is the best exemplar because he, but, but all of them do both of that. All of them give you, in effect, something like their own reflections or thought about modernism and then also show you the world. And I think Mussel tries to show you sort of from a lot of different angles, from the point of view of servants, of aristocratic women, of lower class women, of a, a, mer a, a right. crazy uh, murderer. Um, he's trying to integrate all of these points of view. And uh, I think uh, all of them are supposed to be inflected by this modernist condition, but none of them so much as the protagonist Ulrich, who is the man without qualities. And that's the very, um, that very condition. It's almost like all these other characters are potential versions of, they haven't quite come to Ulrich's realization yet. They're in this modern condition, but they don't see that they're in it. And he sees that he's in it. And so he's just not attached to anything about, it's not just that he's not attached to any set of values. He's not attached to anything about himself. He doesn't, he might have anger or whatever. It sort of wells up in him, but he's not um, identified with it. Um, he almost doesn't have a self, the, the German version, Eigenschaftness, like he doesn't have what is his own or it is himself. He's a man without a self. I'm interested in maybe this particular character and this book, again, as a representative example of this larger trend, that is to the extent they deviate, they're less interesting. So I'm interested in what can we summarize as the overall correlates of this key change in era? And you've named some of them, but you know we want to maybe say what what are the strongest correlates? Certainly, one as you mentioned was a degree of lack of inspiration or motivation. Some degree of you know things are broken, fragmented, uh, you know, alienated. Some degree of dislike, perhaps, of their world. Uh, another was the um, breaking with the past. That is some way in which these characters feel they can no longer inherit or embrace what were recently available, well-structured cultures, values, norms, etc. And for some reason, they feel that even though they don't like what new thing they have that much, they definitely don't want to go back. Somehow they're definite about wanting to embrace this new thing compared can to... Can I interrupt you on that? Sure. So I, right now, I've, I've lived down from Musil and I'm reading Hermann Broch, um, it's also an uh, Austrian of the same time period, um, and he has this trio of novels called The Sleepwalkers, and in the first of the three, there's this character whose brother dies in a duel over honor. And you can sort of see that the character, not only the character, but kind of the character's father, right? So this is the so. Yeah. There's a kind of incredulity, like he died for honor. The, the father keeps saying it, he died for honor. And it, it's not that the the brother thinks how um, uh, how stupid or how foolish or I don't want to live like that. It's like it's it's another world. Like he can't quite imagine right. it. Um, it's it's already it's his brother, but it's already like some distant past that you could die to right. do over honor. Uh, and so somehow it's something Brock represents it as something that it's only happened very quickly, right? His brother can die right. honor, and he's just well, that like. That's the December 2010 line, exactly. i.e. a exactly. sudden change. So maybe, you know, it changed for different times for different people, but there's a perception for each person of a break, a right. break and, of values. I mean, in particular, the younger, the, the sorry, the, 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 the main character, whose name I'm just not remembering at the moment, um, he goes off to the military and goes and lives in the city. And uh, the brother is like at home on the, more rural estate, right? So it's the right. Um, he becomes a modern first, right? So there's some idea that the switch here is correlated with uh, urbanity, industry, international connections, those sorts of things. So many of the key trends of the era are thought to be not unrelated to this break, but still, there's the question: what is the essence of this break? Um, so we have these two correlates, I guess, so far. There's a break, perception of a break. And some reluctance or just distance from the past culture that people had, you know, raced up until then. Secondly, there and internationalism 
is another one. That is, it's very striking that this set of novelists are yes. geographically so widespread. A lot of them met each other, though, and right. um, they people just traveled a lot in this time period. In the novels, in these novels, you see a lot of traveling. People constantly getting right. on enough trains. Although I'm expecting most of the poorest people were into it. This, this, these are elites. I expect. This is a phenomenon but... of elites. We're just not talking. Right. Though, though the uh, though the novelists are interested in some of the poor people, and the poor people figure it's not that they don't figure in the novels, right. but there's a kind the the privileged point of view. Not necessarily elites, but um, uh, but not you know, immersed into the new wealthier economy, even if they're at the poor end of it. Like they're yeah. in cities, they're in industry right they might be servants even but they're still in immersed in this new world yes um okay so we've and so that the first correlate was this break or you know connected to modernity in some way some uh, like correlated with immersion in the modern world there's this perception of a break a sharp break and secondly as we talked about there's some degree of malaise some you know, whereas previous culture and art had, you know, been pretty confident of its values and the things it celebrated and that it was motivated by them, this is less surely motivated and confident and more seeing fragmentation, alienation, et cetera, and just experiencing it as a mi at least mild negative. That's a second correlate here. Another one is that it's just this literature is much more intellectual. So... Yes, I'll it in ways. Um, there's a lot of ratiocination. There's a lot of like um, stream of consciousness where you inhabit someone's point of view and you're getting the workings of their mind. But more specifically, the workings of their mind are theorizing. Um, there, a lot right. of these things are kind of filled with essays. Um, yes. in, in Musil, there's an essay on essays. <laughs> um, so we're in there. I haven't got to that one yet, but uh, and just like the fact that the main character in Musil is an intellectual. Right. So, so we have three correlates now. I guess I want to like list as many correlates as we can before we try to like put them together to make sense of them. Uh, but you know, it, yes, it's intellectual and abstract. That is, abstraction is a relatively prominent feature of modernism, uh, certainly in struct sculpture and architecture and the visual arts, but in other in literature too, to some degree. That it goes along with the intellectualism. That is, intellectuals are abstractly intellectualizing. <laughs> In there, it's, un it's unusual for novels. That's not the way most novels have worked. So, there, so, so here's another thing though that goes along with the intellectual is a kind of aphoristic quality. Like Musil is filled with just great like one-liners. Uh, there'll just be a line and it will kind of resonate with you, so that you get the feeling that he's like, I don't know, part sociologist or giving you a theory, like giving you a not just a take. Right. You hot take on like what's on, you know, what women want or. Right. Um, I mean, that's the thing I liked most about Tolstoy. In my mind, Tolstoy was the king of that for me. He, he, I think mean, Luzel is way more of that than Tolstoy is. But um, what, what I like most about Tolstoy is that he has a theory of his characters that he'll explain to you. And then you can watch the characters play out the theory. But he's not, you know, just showing, not telling. He's definitely telling you. Uh, then that I like that. Then you can evaluate his theory that way. But they are somewhat, you know. Right. I, so I think it's quite different what Musil is doing. For it's usually Musil is giving you an aphorism from the mind of Ulrich. That is, it's Ulrich who has the aphorism, right? right. He has this character who's very insightful, and his, it's not that he's insightful like about his himself or other people. I mean, or right. other characters. It's about like the human predicament. It's supposed to transfer directly, I think, to the life of the reader, like. It's almost like you read this as a kind of a instruction manual for life, and it's going to contain um, it's going to contain little little insights or ideas. Right. So the fourth correlate stands out to me as almost the strongest, which is just the experimentation and variety. That is, um, compared to previous artistic errors, it seems like people are just going in many different directions here, trying out many different ways to be different. And in Musil, there's the parallel campaign, an almost sarcastic description of the strong urge these people. They're not just wallowing in alienation. They they believe that they could make things better if only they could innovate properly. And they're they're really obsessed with creating social groups together, all celebrating the very idea of innovation without actually having much of an idea what to do, which is kind of the satire. But still, you see the strong urge or, you know, 
being part of a process that made a new version and had hope for it in some degree. Right. So we should say that the parallel campaign is a... So in Germany, the um, emperor or whatever has been reigning for 30 years, but in Austria... Um, He's been reigning for, and they're and they're going to have a celebration of the thirtieth year thing. But in Austria, the guy's been around for seventy years, and so they want to have a parallel campaign, i.e., not really parallel, but saying we're better than you, you know, Prussians, um, uh, uh, and uh, and so they're going to have like throw an even bigger party than the uh, the Germans are throwing, and um, and they just have to find an idea, like what is the campaign going to be about? And so the, the 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 novel is structured around trying to find this idea. And then at one point, I think still in the first novel, Count Leinsdorf, this sort of um, royal eminence who's the, the highest status person in the in the group, um, decides it's going to be action. <laughs> the theme is going to be action, <laughs> but they don't know what kind of action, right? And, right. Um, it, somewhere in the second volume, they 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 move towards the idea of peace, and then the general gets nervous, right? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, but then he decides, well, war is for the sake of peace. So still, they could be the, the, for the sake of peace. We could be right. you know, promoting this increased size of the military um, because war is for the sake of peace too. So there is this sense of like we want to find something good. We want to find some new big idea to unify around. And I think it is. You're right that it's satire, but. It's also the whole idea of the novel is of being at this time where you feel like you have all these resources and all this intellectual power and all of these possibilities. Um, um, oh, he's a man of possibilities. He prefers possibilities to actualities. That's sort of how the novel starts. And But kind of not knowing what to do with any of it because the goals or ends in the service of which people have acted until now seem they're like honor they're just off the table and so the parallel campaign isn't just a joke it's also the kind of serious project of the novel to be like let's find something that all of this can be for it can be used for and the novel is famously unfinished unfinished in a really deep way there's like thousands of pages that he wrote he kind of kept writing he kept at one point he sent out a bunch of pages to be published and then withdrew them at the last minute so like i've read about 1700 pages of it but that's just all that's been uh Put out in an English edition, there's like a lot more pages that one could read. Um, right. And he, he, he develops in a bunch of different directions. Um, so he, he really couldn't decide what, basically he couldn't decide what on this idea, on the good, right. it was going to go in, in, in the service. Right. And most other authors do manage to have a center of their book and finish them, but he can serve as an, a representative of the larger structure, which is typically all these different artists or authors, etc., go in pretty different directions with their new innovative approaches. And there isn't that much consensus really on what the best direction is. The a distinguishing feature of this era is in fact just this divergence. That That's not how I would put it because that suggests that there's some clear way that Joyce went and some clear different way that Bruff went and some clear third way that Proust went. Uh, and we could name all those ways and then we could say, okay, they all went in different directions. But that that I like I I'd be like tell me tell me the answer what what did Joyce go for what did Proust go for, um, and uh, it's just not clear to me like in mo- in most of these cases you can't even tell in one person what direction they went. Well, you can't tell of a unifying concept that organizes what they did, but you can certainly just see that they have a different style. That each of these books is a different. different... Style, but that's not the same thing as saying they each found some big idea. Well, that's saying they found a big idea, but idea. but they were each motivated by this passion to try something different. I mean, they certainly weren't copying older styles, right? This is an era of people innovating and creating new styles. That's the most distinctive aspect of this era, really, is the number of different styles being created and explored. And in part, through the same sort of energy of the parallel campaign, there a lot of celebration and hope was put into this, you know, basically... We should. We need. We're going to find a new way to, to get unified and have value and and have hope, and inspiration, and we need to go look for it. Yeah, and then at some point, at some point, people said that's not going to be possible, and they just said hey, we're going to give up on it. But there certainly is a sense of, an ancient culture is just this integrated thing that knows what it wants and knows what it values and 
you know, has all the parts working together and is sort of constant, consistent across time. And then a break with, no, we're not going to be trying to do that anymore. We're going to be trying now to be looking for a whole bunch of different things. We, we feel a loss a bit from this change. And I, it does seem that a lot of it is motivated by a perception of art as reflecting larger society. In fact, there were lots of social changes happening. And those social changes were also undermining people's previous expectations about the world. Uh, and, you know, the world before this modern break was a world of relatively stable cultures, which had a rel you know, the stable concept of what they valued and people's relations to each other and things like that. And culture, high culture was part of that, tended to uphold the highest ideals and to uh, inspire people. And then this new world is a break. One of the most striking features is that people are um, looking now for something consciously feeling that there's a lack of something and trying to replace it by a search uh, as in the parallel campaign, I guess. They, and then that's these are the two of the distinctive features here. One is a sense of loss of coherence and, and value and an unwillingness to go back, but still a sense of needing something like that, but now more appropriately for this new world. And feeling like the arts were going to take the lead, perhaps, in helping us go search for such things. And that a lot of prestige and hope was put into the arts for this identity. It wasn't just a, you know, relaxing thing to do or a, you know, pretty things to put in pretty places sort of thing. There was right. a sense of this mattered. Right. I think that that's right. Um, um, I mean, I think, you know, the idea, there, there's this, the idealization of the artist as a kind of genius goes back a lot further it goes back to you know right but this is not an explorer the inventor the artist as explorer inventor not just a genius right right um that that that's that's i think may, maybe maybe it is distinctive of this time that the artist is somehow tasked with the pro the cultural problem there's a cultural problem we need to solve and we hand that problem over to um while maybe partly to artists and maybe partly to new philosophers. Um, so people like, you know, Nietzsche and, I mean, Nietzsche's before this period, but Wittgenstein is right during this period, well, and then Heidegger is a little bit later. I mean, we've always deferred to elites and prestigious people about culture, but in a world of stable culture, then we learn the best of culture from prestigious people and then let them, you know, recommend specific things like going to war or things like that on the basis of their better understanding of our shared culture. But when you decide that culture's broken or lost, now their task is more important. <laughs> no longer are they just the interpreters and communicators of our shared culture. They have to go find a new one. Right. But also, like, it also in a way demotes them because they have to find it, but like, at what point do we decide that they did a good job or not? Um, and if they're not just handing down a received culture, then they can be critiqued. And so there is a there is a lot of like um, critiquing of the of it. Like in Musil, right? What you have are these gatherings of elites in these salons, and um, kind of them not getting anywhere. They're they're being put, in a way. It's almost like the elite is finally put to the test. Um, okay, if there isn't meeting, are you able to find it? Then they're not, they fail the test. And so it's almost like uh, we're sort of seeing the um, the downfall of the elite itself. If It's right. not clear that the elite is up to the task of finding new values. They, they were maybe just barely up to the task of like handing down the set of received values. So there's this concept of modernism. And then strikingly, of course, we live in, a modern world, but we are no longer in the modern era. We're in the postmodern era. And if you ask, well, what's the difference exactly? The, the, some of the things people say are about, well, postmodernism is giving up on some of the hopes and ideals and grand self-concepts of the moderns. In some sense, a group, you know, accepting more, well, I guess we can't do that. We're, we're not going to find it for you. 
So I think that, um, like the you might you might, um, you know, depending on what we call modern, um, um, if you take someone like Zola, who is one generation before all these people, she has a kind of a bit of optimism about the power of technology and new forms of social organization and like um especially in you know the novel that we talked about the one about the department store but um uh the, so there's this kind of early period um uh let's say you know the late 19th century but we're not yet over to just pre-world right. war one where there's thought like we're gonna have this new world and everything's going to be amazing and so the dreams of the alignment are going to be fulfilled and the the authors that I'm talking about are already postmodern in that sense. They're that the, right. the, the most striking property of all of these novels is that they're all doubters. Um, that is, there are no right. heroes. There's nothing like um, there's no sense of like some great good that can show up and be achieved. Okay, maybe a limp. I mean, that's what they say about themselves. But then these postmodern go out of their way to say, no, you guys were too hopeful. Really, we mean it. We're more down than you. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm just not sure that that is right. Um, that is, I, I guess, like when time goes on, you have to say you're a new era at some point. Right. But it's not obvious to me. That they may not have actually been farther down, but it is more striking that pers in the baby, in some sense, they decide we now need to admit more that we're down. Maybe people were more having the hope that it's a mix of up and down, and now we're going to more say, nope, it's down. I don't know. Like I think that these people are more down than we are <laughs> in a lot of ways. I, I'm just not. Right. That none of that seems compelling to me. I think that, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of very very deep skepticism about convention and morality, and Joyce is just with the way that he um it gravitates towards showing what is disgusting, what his audience is going to find disgusting, the way that um Musil's novel it's veering towards incest. I mean, that's the direction that it's heading. He doesn't ever quite. That, that part doesn't get published, but um, it there 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 these people are kind of more counter countercultural than we are, and I think maybe more pessimistic. So a hypothesis that you mentioned to me recently uh, is the idea that during this modern era we were looking to these high cultural prestigious people, including philosophers and fine artists and others to find us a new sort of set of anchors. Uh, another way that these characters are thought called described as lost at sea, and some says they've lost an anchor. And we were looking to them then. And then World War I and World War II and the countercultural revolution of the 60s just offered us new cultural anchors. And yeah. we didn't need to look to modern art so much anymore for them, e even though they aren't the sort of anchors maybe the modern artists were looking for. But they did for the rest of us. We we found them acceptable, and we now are less feeling lost at sea and less uh, looking are. for new. I do think that the kind of, we kind of have we had like a refresh or something like like after World War II, the idea it's impossible to decide what's right and wrong was hard. It was like we know what's wrong. Nazis, Nazis are what's wrong. So the the kind of very deep skepticism and relativism of this like. You know, pre World War One, but also also post World War One period, um, became un unfashionable um, in the face of the fact that the Nazis are evil. We all know that, so we all have like moral bedrock to to build on. Um, I, I think that not that's just right. the Nazis. That is, I think the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s or so was also a big way that people created new positive anchors. That is, they saw themselves as rebelling against things they didn't like even from the post-World War II culture. And we have accepted in many ways the new cultural anchors and ideals of the 60s. Right. But so it's really interesting to compare the 1960s rebellion with the kind of rebellion going on in, in Musil, where these characters are very much questioning conventional wisdom, like Ulrich thinking of having a, uh, marrying basically his sister, okay, like not in accord with social mores at all. Um, uh, just for one example, there are lots of other examples. Um, and but I think that the difference is that in these um, novels, 
the characters are not imagining that they've now found the moral truth that it's just this is it now it, they were wrong before but now we've got it they were much more able to be met us and to be like well probably this thing is the thing that the next generation rebels against and so we can't even have um we can't even firmly insist on this where right. the cultural illusion was more like okay now we got it it's the way like every generation is like well my time right. wrong but we this time this time this is for sure um and so that's part of why I'm saying this 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 period is has a much much deeper skepticism, much more of a downer, much more pessimistic. Um, and it may be that right now we're coming back to that mood, to the mood of we're just really at sea and we don't know what we should be aiming for. I mean, we're a mix of people who do think they have the answer to our loss anchors for us to choose and others who feel more lost in at sea. Well, so I think that's right. And there's a lot of people who think they have the answer. So what we have is like a situation with like a very blaming culture wars with people who feel extremely sure about a variety of different answers. Um, and, but that's like, um, it's a little bit like the each generation being like, no, now we've got it, except all happening at the same time. And one group of people is like, we've right. got it. And then they've got, we've right. got it. Um, but that it, in a way it's like, it's a, it's just a less self-conscious and less sophisticated version of this predicament. And I guess, you know, the moosels of today are not the people who are stomping their feet. And there were probably people stomping their feet in Bussel's time as well. In fact, we know there were because that's how the Nazis came to be. Um, so, right. Um, right. So I, I guess if we're painting, there's a particular part of the world that's especially intellectual and reflective. And this part of the world knows that they are at sea and haven't found a new anchor. Uh, and they intellectually describe this fact and reflected on it. And then perhaps water artists today, those kind of artists aren't the most prestigious artists of our era, but at one point, they happened to be the most prestigious artists. You might say, well, it's, it's noble or virtuous to be such an reflective intellectual, but we might ask the standard, okay, but what good came exactly of their, for a time, being the most prestigious, being able to push on the rest of the world this reflective intellectual perspective what good came of that that is w was somehow i mean i guess you know it happened just before world war one uh or world war two so did they somehow put off the war a bit make us better handle the war i mean or other were we better able to handle modernity as, as things were changing with this reflective intellectual stance i mean w one thing is Quite a lot of people would say these are just the greatest works of art human beings have ever made. Um, that, or, or certainly there's an incredible density in an incredibly short period of time. Um, and uh, so that's one thing they did. Um, uh, these are probably people who especially appreciate intellectual art. Because this was a peak period of intellectual art, right? People, critics today do appreciate intellectual art. Why? Because they've been shaped by this art. That is, this art made people appreciators of intellectual art. Except, so, in addition, not enough to appreciate it today. I'm sorry. Not enough to appreciate it today. That is. Well, that's the. I mean, I think that um, there's a weird thing about art, which is like it doesn't. Even if we really, really appreciate art deco, that doesn't mean we produce art deco. And I don't know why that's the case, but. You, you, it doesn't seem like you can simply go back and just do, you know, the kind of art in the past, even if you like it. It's it like sort of dies, and then it's not. Saying, I I I don't I don't have an explanation for that, but that's just a very general fact, and it's not particular about this. But um, uh, there's something I wanted to say. Hold on, hold on. Um. Oh, so a striking um feature which we didn't mention, Orlet, is that. This kind of art is very challenging for the consumer of the art. It's hard to understand. It's hard to read. These novels are really hard to read. Uh, like this. Them, sometimes you need to read them like with James Joyce, you with like a guide or something. Um, and if we think of art from the past, 
a lot of it is hard for us now, but wasn't hard for its contemporary audience. Even Shakespeare was a, right. you know, an, an artist for the people. And so that's a new, um, uh, seems to me to be something new about this kind of art is that it challenged its contemporary audience in a distinctive way. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether that's good or bad, or but it's something that it did. No, I, I want to go back to this idea of innovation and this idea of not being willing but go back to old styles because yeah. there's really sort of two very different causes of change that look pretty similar from a distance. One cause of change is a search for the new uh, where you're basically paying a cost initially. You're going to be rougher and less less elegant and less well understood. but the payoff will be that when you finally find something, then uh, you'll be able to build on it and use it for things. That's a search for innovation. But another similar thing is fashion, which is often seen as a rather different process and, of course, had gone, gone way back for several centuries before this time in clothing and other sorts of things, which is just the idea that uh, it has to be new to be popular. And there's this urge to figure out what new thing will be popular, but you're not going to save it up and build on it. You're going to have a new thing and have it be popular and toss it away and go to the next new thing. So um, we have this initial puzzle of why when you had a very established civilization for a long time with a lot of people agreeing on its values, all of a sudden you have this break. And one of the key distinguishing features of the break is people don't know what to do. They know they don't want to do the past thing. Somehow they feel really confident of that. And that looks a lot like fashion. It looks like maybe there was a fashion element that could push this forward of Whatever we do, it must not be what we've been doing, because that would be unfashionable. I think it's the other way around. So it's that um, this predicament where the one thing you know you can't do is just like keep going with honor um, makes you well. You see yourself as the man without qualities. That is the 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 the, the, the civilization without qualities, where there's nothing that's essential to you. There's nothing that's written into who you are. And the way you might express that is as soon as you've done something for a little while, you have to start doing another thing um, because you wouldn't want to be giving the impression that you were tied to that first thing because the the, the one insight you you got is that you are without qualities. So the fashion would be the product, the, the, the quick switching of fashions would be the product of this insight. There's a there's a there's a there's a great um, speaking literally of fashion. There's a great discussion in the Man Without Qualities where Ulrich Ulrich has many mistresses, women, but one of them um, finds out that he's interested in another woman, and she starts. So Bonadea is his mistress, who he uh, right kind of ditches, and he's interested in Diatima, who's also his cousin, more incest, um, and um, and Bonadea starts looking like Diet, like dressing like her and doing her hair and like almost as though she could maybe transform herself into this other woman. And then when she despairs of that project, she then changes back and starts to look different again. Oh, so we can set aside maybe deciding what the ultimate cause of the change is, but I was just highlighting there's a difference in the fashion style change than in the innovation style change. In innovation style change, you look at different new things, but when you find a new thing that works, you stop looking you, you don't just throw it away because it's no longer new. You keep it. Uh, but you might have to look through a lot of things before you found something new to keep. But then once you found something, you'd keep it. Whereas the fashion change, you won't, you'll just keep it for a certain time and then switch it regardless of how promising it's been. And we could ask which of these two kinds of changes best characterizes the modernist change pattern. Uh, because, because then, you know, we could dig into the deeper theories under like, and either one of them, uh, you could say the essential change was to realize that you, there was nothing stable about you, but that still, that seems unexplained to me. Like, okay, but why would that happen? At least I can understand fashion as a thing that sometimes spread. That is, we, we have norms at different times about which things fashion applies to and which things they don't. And maybe fashion moved over to art and suddenly fashion applied to art, whereas it hadn't before. That doesn't make sense to me. That is, fashion's not some independent power that can spread like that. I think that if you think about, like, Ulrich and how he'll unaccountably, like, one day he just leaves town, his father dies, and he just leaves town and moves to his father's house and, like, forgets about all his past um, 
commitments to the parallel campaign, all of that, right? And then he's just hanging out with his sister in his father's house for like a while. Um, and um, and then that's the moment in the story when you learn he has a sister because he, he didn't mention her at all in the whole first yeah. part of the novel. So it's like there are these things that show up for Ulrich suddenly. His life suddenly is, is susceptible to sudden. The whole novel starts because he takes a year off from life. He was like a mathematician and he's just like, I'm going to take a year off to explore myself. He's in his 30s. Um, at, so so the person who is connected to his qualities is going to be subjected to his moods or his whims or something like that. So Ulrich is a man of fashion. Um, and that's not because he's somehow become infected with fashion. It's because the other thing isn't there, the thing that would ground him or tie him. And he's surrounded by people who are like, no, I'm very tied to a very particular kind of lifestyle. This is what I have to do. Um, and he is the one who sees, well, that's just a thing you kind of made up for yourself. You wouldn't need to be. Um, and so the the fashion comes in to fill a certain kind of void. But I agree that it's fashion and not innovation. And there's there's a I think a deeper question about like is there does this distinction ultimately hold up? Um, that is, whenever there's any innovation, you keep it, but you keep it for a little while until you find something better yet, right? And um, and yeah, but you'd be using that better standard as opposed to the, the old standard. <laughs> fashion, you more use the standard of you get rid of it when it's old. Whereas for innovation, you get rid of it when you find something better. So. Right. But you might, I think many, many people in fashion will have no trouble seeing the new thing is better and will not as well. Easy to rationalize. But when, yeah. when Ulrich, you know, stops his job is because he realized the year off was better. Did he go home because he realized it was better? He didn't actually have evidence that any of those things were better. He just was getting tired of something and wanted to switch. Well, if he, um, I, th I think he does rationalize it to himself. And um, uh, and if you think that a lot of our received values are just kind of illusions that we're holding on to, then the person who is saying, no, um, it's better when we switch to the kinds of luggage that has wheels, because we can move through the airport faster, they will say, like, that just became a fashionable thing to want to move through the airport faster. Earlier, it was more fashionable to want to move through the airport stylishly, which our old luggages were much more stylish, which they were. Um, and the new luggages are just lighter weight. Um, and so I, I, I guess I think it, the, 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 the mindset of Ulrich and Musil is precisely a mindset that doesn't feel like it can help itself to the idea of better than. That's the whole problem. We don't know what's the good. So uh, one key puzzle in this phenomena is what could have caused this sudden change and why was it a sudden break as opposed to a gradual change? That, that you know, that's a key thing to explain in this world. So we want to, like, remember what things were like before this break and then see what, compare that to how things are different after the break. I mean, it's not obvious to me that it was a sudden break. It, but many it, people it, describe it as such. It's that way a little bit by some of these artists, but I, I'm right. Not... Okay, but there's still looking farther back. You definitely see for many centuries before, there was a different pattern, and then within a relatively short time, say a century or so, we got to this new pattern. So something changed, and we want to know what caused this change, and. A candidate that's, you know, fits with the cultural drift idea and some of what people say is that the world became less coherent. That is, as technology and society changed in huge ways, like we talked previously about peasants and the Frenchmen, only one of many huge changes in this period, people now saw this new world as less coherent, as making less sense. That is, previously there was a world that had a bunch of parts that all fit together, including high culture. And, you know, they had a self-concept of their culture and what it was and what they value that people accepted. And then a whole bunch of things changed. And then people had the sense that it was hard to fit. <laughs> it's hard to pick a new or to know what the new artistic style that would fit rightly with this new world would be and what motives that art art should have and what values it should project. They, they felt that the world had fragmented and become less coherent and less compelling. And then they were lost at sea and that would compel a search for something better or at least 
as an excuse for now following a fashion. I mean, I, I guess from the point of view of, let's say, somebody who lives in a small village, you know, in France in 1850, uh, before before the change, um, and where all of your ancestors have lived in that village and where you pretty much never leave the village, um, you would, um, you might have a very sort of unified um, world. It would be a small world and there would be other worlds that were quite different from it. Just right. They might not even be that far away from you geographically. They might speak a different language in one village over. Um, and so, I mean, in one way, there was way more fragmentation in 1850, um, but it's not experienced oh, as such. Right, right. What part there, were, what's going on? there were many worlds, but each world was coherent. Right. And part of what's going on in this change is actually a homogenization so that all these worlds are actually becoming much more similar to one another. Like they're, there's, they're sharing a bigger world, which itself is less coherent. That is, this bigger world makes less sense to people. In Right. So there's a question of why doesn't it make sense? And so like one, I don't know, one very, one, uh, one story that I feel like is the default story that is told by philosophers um, is that the promise of the Enlightenment somehow was broken. That... Um, we had this idea of, you know, um, there was there was a kind of rigid religious slash Aristotelian scholastic order, and that order started to be dismantled, you know, by people like Descartes and Galileo, Descartes, um, and there was this idea of the new scientific order that was going to come into existence, and it was going to sort of free us. Um, uh, it was going to be an order of freedom. And um, and the, the the line of philosophers that comes out of, you know, from, from Descartes, you get to Kant, for whom the fundamental idea is a certain kind of freedom and self-constitution. Um, but then the people who are receiving Kant are, and this is, you know, we both read Robert Pippin's book, um, uh, Modernism is a Philosophical Problem. This is uh, this is how we, they, we, they, they our our viewers can, our our even our viewers won't be able to see that because I was talking. So say something and then show the book. Here's the book, I okay. So um uh the um this this sort of Kantian notion of freedom, which is itself a variant on and cr comes from a critique of Descartes. This Kantian notion of freedom gets critiqued by Fichte by Hegel um as um you know. Like, what is it to give yourself laws or be autonomous? And um, and the this modern period is the period where that critique kind of just falls apart in the sense of maybe this whole idea of freedom or self-constitution just doesn't work because it doesn't have any matter or anything to grip. So that if I'm totally free, I just don't know what to do. And that's what you see in these characters is that they're very free, um, but they're lost. So that, like, the idea of the Enlightenment was everyone's going to be free and that's going to be awesome. And then here we are, people are free, and it's not awesome. So we're seeing two different transitions at two different points in time. First, there's a transition from a previous dogmatic, very structured world to a world of promise of freedom. And in that world of the promise of freedom, I still think you have a pretty integrated culture and fine arts. And then you have this breaking up of the fine arts culture where it fragments and becomes more alienated and more fashion oriented. And you're trying to explain that second change in terms of the first. Yes, because the the story that Pippin wants to tell, I think, is just that um, the first change wasn't complete. That is, we held on to little vestiges of dogmatism like honor. Um, right. It didn't really make sense with the concept of freedom. And once we'd cleanse the last relics of dogmatism, that's when we realized we were lost. But as he says, we did not cleanse the last relics of dogmatism. That is, we failed to achieve this freedom. So we, in fact, realized that we had dogmatism. So why couldn't we just go back to the old dogmatism? Why did we have to move in this other direction to, to, to be lost? So that we could have decided that, no, it's impossible to sort of escape your past and the dogmatic inheritance that you get from tradition. So let's just go back to tradition. But they did it. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I think it's not quite right to say that they failed. In most ways, they succeeded. That is, people genuinely didn't care about honor, and there genuinely wasn't anything that took its place. And um, and maybe the point is that you could that this process was only a negative process. That is, you could you could get rid of the bits of dogmatism one by one until there weren't very many left, but you weren't at the same time adding new ones. It's it, it, and it's not very easy to add a dogmatism to be like now let's let's dogmatically adhere to this. That's just a move we don't find very easy. Um, certainly, many ancient civilizations and periods have been able to add dogmatism. I think Increasing dogmatism has definitely been a thing. Not no, but certainly not by by like being. No, but just that it happens it. indirectly. Maybe, but the point is that like that like, maybe it, the, the one I can't. I mean, certainly these cultures did right. So you had Nazism. They added a dogmatism, which didn't last very long. Um, uh, that is the dogmatisms we try to add are not very stable. Um, they, because partly they're constantly being subjected to critique. Uh, to people being like, well, is this really, is this really the ultimate good? So that, that, that like, it's like, it's every value we are considering is bathed in the acid water of critique and, um, you know, like, and kind of skepticism. Well, this is a somewhat different theory of basically saying there's a slow effect of criticism and maybe sort of making criticism the most prestigious thing that at least in the most prestigious world nothing would stand up to criticism so they lost more and more shared values as they subjected everything to criticism it's different because i think that what the criticism is it's what the criticism is supposed to be is it's supposed to be a be so descartes had this idea let me examine my beliefs from the fountain. Let me start from zero and try to build up. You know, once in my, he's like, once in your life, you should do this. You should throw away all of your preconceptions and just try to build your knowledge up out of nothing. And uh, Kant is like, well, you know, the core move that you use there, the I think, therefore I am, you have this I am that looks like you posited some metaphysical substance, like you're a thing, but you didn't subject that to your critique. That is, um, um, and, and basically that same move is going to be the move that Fichte makes in relation to Kant. So it's like the, 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 this, uh, push towards autonomy and freedom is the same thing as the move of critique. And well, except so, the, when, the autonomy and freedom is apparently not subject to the country because you could. No, it is. It, that, that's fundamentally what's getting the critique. So. No, but in the end, you're. Philosophical texts. That's. That's what the critique is a critique of, and that's why, like, Kant's theory of autonomy is seen at, I mean, Hegel says his... Okay, but what you end up with was a bunch of people who say, I refuse to accept dogma and tradition, and I'm going to just act on my freedom and autonomy, and that's this thing. new world. I think that's my point. Those are not... No, but the, the freedom and autonomy is a dogma. That is the dogma that you should be acting on freedom. That's all another dogma. Apparently, they just weren't questioning that one so much. I don't think that's right. So, like, I think if you if you look at how Ulrich acts, it's not as though there's anything where he's constantly like, "This is what I have to act in the service of." It's all just negative. He's being driven by by negative stuff. But he's yeah. consciously rejected tradition. But he's not consciously rejected following his own inclinations. He does reject following his own inclinations. That's the whole point of being a man without qualities: is that none of his impulses are his own, and he rejects them. But he follows them. His <laughs> whole no, but almost like, all the time. He is not taking yeah, outside he's, direction, he sort of right? He follows them whimsically, and then he'll follow another one. He won't follow it yeah. through. But he's, um, all of them are things coming from within him. He's just not following outside orders at all. He's not he's doing what outside is... outside orders, too. For instance, when other people are like, you should be, you got to be part of the parallel, parallel campaign. And he doesn't see any reason to be part of the parallel, parallel campaign, but he goes along with it. But compared to somebody several centuries ago, whose life would be much more determined by tradition and their place in society, etc., his life is much less determined by those things, right? It's, well, it, it, it's very sporadically. Like, it's determined by a lot of different things. He's kind of buffeted around. He He's he's a, a bit of a hostage to both his, you know, moods and the world around him because all he has is this negative critique, I think. Um, I, I don't, I mean, occasionally he's dogmatic. It's not like he's not capable of dogmatism. Like, there's a, there's a part in the, in the second, or is it in the third novel, 
where his um, sister wants to fake their dad's will to change a lie in the will. And all of a sudden, Oleg becomes a moralist and he's like, no, we can't do that. Oh, um, but say, moving away from this one character, if we just ask what is common among people in this modern world, mm -hmm. they are less following tradition. They are less accepting their role in the world as specified by the town they grew up in and their parents and et cetera, right? They are, in fact, exercising a lot more freedom and autonomy in their lives and enjoying that, but they less feel a guiding star or anchor morally value-wise, and they are feeling somewhat at lost at sea for not having that thing, in part because they have, as a matter of practice, filled their lives with lots of freedom and autonomy. So here's um, just two thoughts I wanted to throw in from stuff I happen to be reading today, not from this period, but... Um, I, I have been reading Foucault's History of Sexuality today, and he makes a really interesting observation about power, that we have this idea of power as only operating to restrict or to prevent. And he's like, like, say, with sexuality, right? It tells you, like, what you're not allowed to do, and not, like, what you have to do. And, um, and his sort of hypothesis is that there is a positive kind of power, too, but it hides its marks a bit like that is when right. um it's it's sure. a bit hard to be like care about this pursue this want this um and um maybe over time um the the kind of negative sort of power that's what what we're seeing is like it's almost like only the negative kind of power is left over and the positive power the power that is um the power to make you want something or pursue it or go after it or care about it um that um that power has a hard time um hiding its footsteps so we don't know why we're, we're running out of time but i guess we should summarize um but there is this interest so that we're seeing something interesting that is that modernism was a change in some things relative to others there was more of a loss of sort of positive vision and sort of positive obligations uh and inspiration that would, you know, attach you to something and move you forward together with your society. And criticism helped, I guess, destroy those things, but somehow criticism didn't so much destroy all the other things that kept people moving and acting because they were continued to move and act. They weren't just, you know, unable to make choices. They did make choices. And so, but perhaps you know, they were very hostage to fashion in those respects. Well, then we could say like, keep them from sticking to anything. Right, and then we'd say, well, why is it that criticism didn't destroy fashions as easily as it destroyed everything else, right? Somehow criticism is... It did, but then a new fashion would come. And that is, it's not going to destroy the meta idea of fashion. Why not? It, it can destroy the meta idea of religion or the meta idea of patriotism or all sorts of meta ideas, but why not that one? I guess um, the change, it seems to me, is something that happens of its own accord unless we resist it. Like, the world is a world of change. And so what, um, what criticism did was take away the things that we have that stand as, like, bulwarks, as, like, supports against change and so then we're just subjected just like your moods are things you're subjected to unless you have a kind of principle of how you're going to act or what you're going to do and so the 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 only way to destroy fashion is to have a principle and the criticism destroyed the principle so we don't have time to to explore but i'll just leave a mark that the, hy the hypothesis that you know i'm thinking in terms of is that there's some sort of more natural human nature that we were drifting towards and we be we were prevented from drifting that in the previous civilizations which had strong roles and norms for us but once we were unmoored we then drifted toward basically a forager style of human nature which tended to be more promiscuous and self-indulgent in many ways and criticism can be more easily embraced when it's against something you kind of don't want anyway and when you want something you 
aren't as eager to look for criticisms of it or to embrace it. But. So that would predict that we would, st um, would, would sort of converge somewhere. And that prediction yeah. doesn't seem to be to have been borne out. That is, for example, people are not more promiscuous these days than they were like 15 years ago, as far as I know. If well, we're looking at like yes. centuries long trends here, but I would say definitely over centuries we are now more promiscuous. But we're talking about like from 1910 to now that we don't have so many centuries. It just hasn't okay, even from 1910 to now, the world is definitely more promiscuous. Maybe the elites haven't haven't changed, but certainly that's just the spread of this culture. It's not the like development of it. So, well, anyways, okay. uh, we should... anyway, thanks for talking. <laughs>